Hello YouTube, time for a video again. Well today's video is about building a DIY fish room on, on the cheap. Very economical fish room, so economical to run. It'll, running this fish room you can run 900 to 1000 gallons of water for the same price as what most people would run a, a 200, 180 to 200 gallon tank. So uh, this is Wolfie, my Dovi, but we're not talking about uh, Dovi's today. We're going to talk about cheap DIY and especially economical to run. Economical to run fish room. So without further ado, let's get on it. Right, all my fish room is, is uh, basically, it's a garden shed. So we'll, uh, we'll take a look inside and we'll, I'll try to explain how we, uh, change, how to convert a fish, a garden shed into a fish room. So uh, here we go, let's open the door and take a look. There's all the aquariums, we've got about 900 to 1,000 gallons total. All running for less than what most people run the average indoor aquarium. Right, I'd say stage one, and uh, one of the most important things to, um, you know, is the heating and insulation. To make, to make the fish room, you know, viable and make economical sense, having a fish room outdoors built into a, your garden shed like you say, you want to pay good attention to insulation and heating. So I'll go through the insulation and heating. Right, this is all the heating what, what's necessary to keep this shed to t temperature. This is an oil-filled radiator and it's only 500 watts. It's got the thermostat on, the little lights on there, it's on. There we go, I've turned it down a bit, it's gone off now. Up again, there it's on. So you fiddle about with the thermostat control. Just keep an eye on your water temperatures and just play with the thermostat. So a 500 watt heater. When I first built this little fish room, I started off with a 2000 watt. And then I came by this little 500 watt and tried that and it does just exactly the same job. So the key, the key to uh, keeping it cheap and economical to run is the insulation. So we'll show you about the insulation. The whole shed is lined with four inches of polystyrene. Four inches on the ceiling, all on the walls, and underneath the floor, underneath the floorboards. There's uh, four, two inches actually on the floor, and there are two inches on the door. Anyway, I'll, I'll explain that and show you what how how I insulate right just before we get on to showing you the insulation one little tip i forgot to say if you're buying a shed or building one yourself i'll tend to go a little bit taller if it's possible if you want to stack the tanks like i have here you know to give room in between to get your hand in and get get rocks in by the time you've got four inches of uh, insulation on the ceiling and you've got your insulation on the floor you lose a lot of height. So for an example, shut the door, we'll stand back. See that this, sh this shed is a, a little bit taller than that one. And uh, ideally, I wish I went a bit taller really. So that's just a little tip. If you want to stack your tanks and have plenty of room to get your hands in and out the tanks, wherever possible, it's not the be all and end all, but if possible, go a bit taller. Little tip I've learnt myself. Right, this is the polystyrene what I use. This this is available in uh, four inch thick uh, pieces and also two inch. I tend to go for the two inch. I'll show you why for in a moment. Yeah, so it, it'll come in at eight eight before sheets. It's very easy to cut, and the reason I like to buy the two inch thick is I'll show you. Right, 
th this cuts very very easily and the uh, uh most most sheds are made of two two by two framework two by two so this will cut down nicely you're cutting with a, a carving knife a sharp knife or, or a little axe or not an axe or a saw so i, I uh, cover fill all the panels in the ceiling and on the walls cover it all with this two inch polystyrene cut to size and then when I've covered the whole lot I'll go over it it's all flush all flush there I'll go over it with the eight before eight before sheets and cover the whole lot so then we've got four inch thick so that that's how I do my insulation I'll uh, I'll show you a few photographs of when I did my fish room it was years ago now but I've got a few photos I'll show you right here's some photographs I've dug out the old archives that's when I've started insulation, insulated the ceiling. And as you can see on the back wall, you can clearly see the 2 by 2s where I uh, cut the strips. Cut them nice and snug so they slot in there. I don't use adhesive. If you cut them tight, they'll just fit in there nicely. And then this is where I've gone over the whole lot with the 8 before sheets. So now we've got 4 inches. 4 inches on the walls, 4 inches on the ceiling. But I only put two inches on the door and two inches on the floor. So this is where I'm trying the racking for size. That's where the two six two six two by twos go. Just uh, and this is the other on the other side where the the six four foots, the six four foot tanks go. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what I'll do now, I'll go on to the second most important thing: filtration. How can you filter? A thousand gallons cheaply and efficiently. Right, stage two, filtration. How do you best filter a thousand gallons of water cheaply and efficiently to run all these aquariums? Right, let's get in there and talk about it. Yeah, what better way and more efficient and cheap way to fill uh, to filter a fish room. What better way is there than using the good old fashioned sponge filter? Highly underrated, highly underrated the sponge filter. I absolutely love them. I'm running 40 sponge filters, 40 sponge filters on one air pump, which is very, very economical. I can run a whole fish room for the price of one aquarium. Yeah, so I've got 40 sponge filters. I have three each in these four foots. So we've got two, two, four, six, six four foots with three sponge filters in. And then we've got two, uh, tick, six foots on top of one another. And they've got six in. Probably not quite necessary. And then we've got all little tanks at the end there. Some of them have got a one each end, some have just got a big one in the middle. And then we've got these down down here. Anyway, in total, we've got 40. Oh, I absolutely love them. Yeah, so this is how we run 40 sponge filters on one air pump. This is my air pump. I'll sh show you a bit more about that in a minute. It's a really reliable air pump. It costs less to run. Than an FX FX six filter, which is uh, probably run one tank, and this is running multiple tanks. Anyway, this uh, is collect, uh, connected up to a closed loop system. Basically, all a closed loop system is is a, this uh, PVC pipe, a uh, tubing, which with the push push fitting connections, you connect it all up, the whole parameter. All the way around the whole fish room. That's why they call it a closed loop. All the way around a loop with no uh, no dead ends. No no dead ends or elbows. Well, not elbows. Sorry, T junctions and bits running off T junctions. You want it's a closed loop all the way round. Right back to the pump again. And the reason for that is if you have. Uh, Dead, dead uh, long extensions and dead ends, it's very, very difficult to get even air pressure. If you've got a closed loop, the pressure around the whole loop 
is equal all the way round. So then what you need to do is uh, tap into it to add your sponge filters. Yeah, my, my pumps only have uh, a low output pump, but you'll be totally, totally surprised how many sponges you can run off it. Yeah, you tap into it, look at all the little valves, you tap into it, so anyway, you want to just drop an airline in and connect it to your filter, and that's the way you go. Right, so what I'm going to do now, I'll show you my, talk about my, show you my air pump, and show you how I drill and tap the uh, PVC pipe. Right, this is the air pump I'm using. Very sturdy, reliable air pump. Designed for koi ponds, really, but it's ideal for a fish put room. This is a Koi Pro High Blow 50. Uh, very economical, reliable, and uh, they go forever. It's a, the output is 50 litres per minute. And it only uses 35 watts of energy, so it's very, very economical. And uh, I have a backup pump also. This is an Acre, Acre Evolution, very reliable as well. But this was slightly bigger than the old one, 95 litres and uh, 62 watts of uh, energy. And here's the, my gang valve where I steal all the little chrome taps off to screw into the uh, closed loop system. There's, there's one unscrewed. And I will uh, show you how I drill the loop system in the PVC pipe and add, add the little taps to the, to the uh, loop system. Right, th these, these are the little taps, airline taps, what I use. And this is uh, taken from a manifold that the uh, manifolds where you can buy with 6, 8, 10, 12 on. I found that a cheaper way. But these are not, not self-tapping. But I'll show you how I attach them to the closed loop system. Right, this, this is an off cut. This is the off cut from the uh, closed loop system. And what, I've, what I'll do is use a, uh, a 6.5 6.5mm drill bit. And we'll uh, just stick a hole in there. There we go. Just get rid of, make sure there's no burrs or anything on it. I mean, some people might put a bit of plumber's tape around there, but I don't think it, I, I've never bothered. So it's not self-tapping, but if you press and screw, press and screw, just keep pressing and screwing it in, that will uh, that'll fix in there quite tightly. And it, it's not gonna leak. Yeah, it doesn't leak. You can get paranoid with leaks. If it lost a little bit of air through there, what, what's, what's it matter? Yeah, so that's how we uh, attach the, the uh, valves to the closed loop system using these little uh, chrome taps. Right, let's move over to the lighting now. Uh, the fish that I keep are uh, Central American cichlids and they're not too worried about really, really bright lights. Well, we're looking at my carpenter cichlid yeah, they, they don't, they're not too worried about bright light, so uh, what I have, I've got two low energy light bulbs. Here we've got, we've got one this, end of the, one this end of the fish room, and one the other end of the fish room. So these low energy light bulbs are on a timer. Yeah, they're on a time switch. We'll have a look at Haitiensis while we talk about it. Yeah, they're on a time switch. This is a male Haitiensis, by the way. The female's over here. They're on a time switch. The low energy light bulbs, they come on in the morning. They're on for about 12 hours. So it's quite dimly lit. But when I come in here in the evening to feed the fish and, uh, and check on them all, I put the big lights on. And the big lights, all I have is like these uh, strip, strip lights. Do you call, would you call them shop lighting or whatever? They've got, LED, they've got LED bulbs in. You could probably see light. So I have these screwed all the way along the rackings. Economical to run. But then again, I don't have them on for that long, to be honest. They're on when I come in in the evening. I always put the lights on when I'm feeding. I never feed in the dark. The fish now got to the stage where when I put, I put the lights on, 
about 20 minutes before feeding time. And then when I come in, they're, they're all, re all ready to be fed. Anyway, that's my lighting. Right, I've got to try to answer questions what people have asked me in the past about water changes. How do you do water changes in your, in your fish room? So basically, it's a primitive. I've just got an inch and a quarter hose. I siphon everything out onto my lawn in the summer. The lawn absolutely loves it. And then I top it up with cold water from the outside tap. But what I've got to say, an important thing, is once, you've, once I've done a 50% water change on all the tanks, it can take 24 to 48 hours for the water to get back up to... Uh, the correct temperature the airspace in the shed will reach temperature nearly instantly because uh it's a very small small uh, fish room right if you're keeping more delicate fish uh you, you can keep a water butt in the shed so so it's all you've always got plenty of water at, at uh, the correct temperature but for what fish i keep this is my jaguar cichlid beryl is as naughty and as aggressive as ever. Anyway, like I said, for the fish I keep, I just thought I'll get rid of the water book. And my fish are tough and tough and hardy. So I'm running uh, 14 aquariums in there. But if you were keeping smaller fish, you could double or treble that amount of aquariums because you wouldn't need quite so quite quite so large. Yeah. So uh, I can run that fish room cheaper than what a lot of people can run. Uh, say a 180 or a 200 gallon tank. Say we've got a, a 35 watt air pump. For example, an FX5, I think they use about 45, 48 watts. So uh, my air pump uses less than an FX5. And the heater, 500 watt. It don't come on that often once it's reached temperature. So this is a, a cheap way, cheap way of uh, running your fish room. I mean, like we'd all like nice posh fish rooms, wouldn't we, with a uh, Big massive sump systems, automated water changes. But in reality, who can afford it? I'd just like to put this out there so people, if they wanted to consider building themselves a little fish room, this it's some pointers. Anyway, it's time to wrap this one up now. I hope it's been of some uh, benefit to one or two people out there if you ever want to consider uh, expanding outdoors into your garden and building a fish room. Anyway, well, I've got to take this opportunity to say uh, thank you for all the subscribers. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like this sort of video, uh, uh, I'll, I'll appreciate if you subscribe. So uh, thanks for watching. Until next time, happy fish keeping to all. And uh, ta-ra! Till next time.